Omaha? Oh, you yeah. already gave him the hi-ho? Yeah, you okay. said you're good to go. Okay, I'm good to go. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, hi. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, Bethany knows I do my best work at lunch, so she provided lunch, and, and that's, that's, that's a fact. I do my best work at lunch. Um, my name is Douglas Grubbs, Captain Douglas Grubbs. Uh, I was a pilot, and I worked in the maritime industry over 50 years. And, and you'll either see my gray or my lack of hair, and I can prove, so I can prove that. Um, before I take you back to the beginnings, the dollar an hour kid that needed a job and, and happened to find one on a river, I'm going to show you what, and for the most part, I, I developed with teams of Coast Guard people, Coast Guard research. This is the term of, the term of art of the day is e-navigation. I'm not sure if that's always going to be the term. People are starting to push back from e but it's electronic navigation. And uh, what you're looking at is a database. Some people would call it a chart, but it's a database. That, and that's the Mississippi River, accurate to, from bank to bank, at mean low gulf to within a few feet. Very, very accurate. I got the $12 million in 2003 for the Corps and NOAA to resur resurvey the river from Baton Rouge to sea, and the now infamous Gulf Outlet, which, of course, we don't use anymore. Um, and basically, that's the carnival I believe, going down the river. And like I said, it's not a simulation. This is a, this is a recording. And I was the pilot on there. The carnivalation going down a river. Every one of these, uh, these little dots and dashes, if it gets into a vector like this one here, that's a vessel on the way. You'll see the, in most cases, the name, its course, its course over ground. And I'm not going to get too much into course over ground versus heading. But its course and its speed, and I just would have to click on him, and I would know where and what time I'm going to meet that particular vessel. I'll show you that a little bit later. But just as we go through, if you get a little bit bored with how hard I worked as a young guy, and I enjoyed every minute of it, I had a ball. I mean, I, let, me, let me just preface. There's a few things I'm going to teach you today that your mom and dad should have taught you, and they might have. And the one thing is keep yourself, like, you know, soap and water is cheap. Use plenty of it. And, and the other thing is just don't quit. You know, uh, don't, don't quit on your dreams, don't quit on your goals. You might have to take a different course from time to time. Like Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. It might be a different strategy, but quitting is not an option. And, and, and that didn't come from my football coaches, that came from my mother. So this is what, and this, and, and, and uh, technology is jumping ahead so fast, this might even be old technology soon. But right now, this is state-of-the-art, and this is from a pilot, that little laptop, the pilot carrier board. They have similar software on ships with these big, huge displays that do almost the same thing, maybe not quite as good as this yet, but they'll, they'll catch up to it. So with this, I can see around points and bends and, and uh, click on vessels that uh, might be hidden underneath the point of bend or behind trees, whereas radar, radar's line of sight. And, and, it, and radar can't, in most cases, can't turn, so you line a sight. All right. Now, you just keep an eye on that. I started in 1962. I was playing, I was going to Warren Easton High School. No Warren Easton graduates? My wife went to Warren Well, My wife went to Warren. I knew there was something about you that was good. <laughs> I knew. What, what year? Uh, like 80, 84. She's our people. 86. She's our people. She went to Warren Easton, she's our people. And we'll take you to um, Warren Easton High School, and and uh, I needed a job, summer job. And my summer jobs was my mother would march me over to Schwegman's, and I'm, I think I was 16 at that time. I said he's really 18 years old. He needs a job, and he and he's a hard worker. And I didn't want to work at Schwegman's. I hated working at Schwegman's because they'd make me do all the gruff, grimy, sweeping up stuff. They put me in the meat department, and, and that's what I did. I scraped up, cut up all that nasty meat. Uh, did any of you guys ever eat crystal hamburgers? You sh <laughs> we should have never done that. I can tell you where those crystals came from, and it, and it was very little meat in that big old barrel. Whatever you didn't use for human consumption, you throw it in a crystal barrel. Um, and I, 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 Anyway, my, I, I had a football coach, Coach Babe, Babe Jindusa, 
And uh, he said, you, you ever work on a river? I said, no, no. no. I, I knew they had a river in New Orleans, but I didn't work on it. And uh, in the 40s, he played football in high, when he was in high school with a, a, who was now a river pilot, Captain Charlie Ono. He said, maybe he can get you a job as a deckhand on a tugboat. They pay a lot of money. And I said, it'd be great. Well, they, he said, go over to Biso Tobo Company, and they know you're coming, and make sure you tell them you're 18 years old. I'm 18 years old. I'm here for a job. He said, oh, we, we, we can only hire you for a couple of months because they had some people out sick. Went down to the tugboat, and, and then they told me it was 75 cents an hour. And I knew the minimum wage was a buck, but I didn't say anything because I had a job. I was riding on a tugboat. I wasn't scraping up. Well, what they had me do on tugboats is scraping paint and rust and splicing wire and working in a scrap iron pile, getting off the tugboat and on the derricks and with all the rigging. And at and, and 98 degrees with all that steel, and it gets hot. But the owner, old man Captain Eddie Biso, he said, he told me, he said, you know why you're not making a dollar an hour, son? I said, no, sir, but that's okay with me. I'm, I've got a job. He said, because we're feeding you. And I said, all right. And feeding on tugboats in those days was you had canned spam. And this, the, now I'm telling you almost the truth. Can, can spam. And, and for breakfast in the morning, they'd slice a nice big slice and they'd pick your eggs for breakfast. They had, in those days, they had cooks on boats. They don't, I don't know if they even have any anymore. Can spam. And, and, and uh, then you, may, you might have a can spam sandwich for lunch. And they'd do something a little bit different. Maybe put some pineapple on top of that spam for dinner. But they did have canned pineapple. And I loved it. I loved it. And then by, I wanted, by the time I got ready to go to college, all of those people, it was a heavy... A lot of alcoholism in those days out there. That's where they would kind of, they, they, they really loved me. When I was going on to college. I said, I wanted to do this. I wanted to be a zoology major. My mother said, maybe you should be a dentist. I said, okay, maybe I should be a dentist. So after two summers of working, I was at McNeese as a zoology major, getting my nose broken, thinking there's something wrong with this picture. I'm not really six foot six, <laughs> like I told my kids later. Uh, I really did like that job on those tugboats, and I found out they had pilots on ships. It just seemed like a pretty neat job. So after a couple of years of getting my nose broken and going through the, the, all the different zoology, I said, I don't want to be a dentist. I never wanted to be a dentist to begin with. So I started full-time at Biso, and then the, it was a dollar and a quarter an hour. And um, I just had it just coming up. The, you, that's how you did it in those days. You come up through a horse pipe. You, you, uh, you finish your college if you can, uh, but for the most part, if you had a goal, and my goal was I wanted to be a pilot, and I know that um, there's a perception out there that you have to be related, uh, but my mother told me that you know, you, if, you, if you really work hard, and these are good lessons in life, and, and you, uh, you do the really, really best you can, people are going to notice that, just like they notice that master's and Ph.D. level, all that, you know, they'll notice people on, in the river who either get a good education and who can demonstrate that by their work ethic and their integrity. And um, so at some point, I got my first captain's job because the, ca the captain didn't show up. He was drunk. The captain didn't show up. And I was, what, 19 years old, and they said, you you're the captain <laughs> on tugboats. I said, wow, I made it. I said, well, not yet. You better bring this damn thing back floating. If you sink this boat or you damage it, you're not the captain anymore. In fact, you don't have a job. It worked out well for me. And, and uh, as time went on, I still wanted to be a pilot. And in those days, in the 60s, the pilots would get on tugboats a lot to get from ship to ship or from the West Bank to the East Bank. There wasn't as much transportation as they know it today, pilot boats out there and, and uh, car services. So we'd pick them up and you'd get to know them personally. And they'd, they'd put up a ladder, make, and you'd, the tugboat would go alongside of the ship, make fast the ship with a couple of lines, and you'd put the ladder up and help the pilot up on the, on the ship. So I got to know them. And as time went on, I got to be the captain of probably the best boat of its day in the harbor. It was the Cappy Biso, whose owner is Cappy Biso. And uh, he was a year or two older than me. He did go to Southern Miss, and I, I didn't hold it against him because he was the boss. He signed my check. But that boat, all of the pilots wanted, because they had the most power, 
You could do a lot more with that boat, assistance ships. You could do hawser work, which was a putting a long line on a ship for dead ships when ships lose, loses power, tow them around. And the pilots really wanted, uh, in those days, the harbor tugs, they were mostly those, they were old steam tugs that were real clumsy. The Cappy Biso was a twin screw, twin rudder boat, very old, but the, uh, everything was all new. The engines and rudders, everything were all new. And I got to be captain on there. And from there, I, um, we had um, my step into the Pilot Association was Easter Sunday, 1969. The Union Faith had a collision under the Geno Bridge with, uh, I can't think of the name of the, the tow now, but he had two uh, bunker barges, two crude oil barges. And uh, they had a double crew of Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese, and they were celebrating, it was Easter, Easter Sunday. And uh, they, they, the sister ship was anchored, so a lot of them got on that ship to ride up. And, and, um, and we blew the barges up. The ship was engulfed in fire. And, and I happened to be in that area. So we found a way to get alongside of the ship with all the oil and everything. And, and, uh, and we saved uh, the, f they had 22 died, and we saved 22. But going alongside, I put, I, then, then I put the ship on the hawser because it was dragging anchor and, until it sank right in front of Paul's office right there. And, and for that, I got, well, this is just a symbol. I, I got a big government taxpayer uh, assisted big gold medal called a Coast Guard Gold, which is the highest civilian medal in the maritime world you can get. And the pilots, um, it was exactly as my mother, my mother said, you know, you do good things and you're successful, people will notice. Well, they had a pilot election um, some months after that, and I was elected to the Crescent Pilots. I quickly... Uh, so I went from a tugboat company with very low tech. Hardly any tugboats had radars, but, but uh, high skill because you had to develop these visual skills by looking out the window and over and over and over again, taking that, like the guy said, this boat better not to be sunk. You better bring, bring in the boat from doing a job under all kind of conditions back into the fleet time and time and time and time again. You, you know, you can't just do it once. It's got to be an everyday effect. So very low tech. I go into the pilot association. And even in the pilot association in those days, it was low tech. They had radars on ships, but some didn't. And when they broke, they just didn't even fix them to where you had to be radar, Coast Guard radar certified. And I came in the first class of that in 1970 or 71, whatever it was. And by that time, I was already uh, an apprentice pilot. And then I got to be a commissioned pilot in about the middle to the late part of 1970. And I rose quickly. I, I, started, I knew that there was a lot more to piloting than just this salary. I'm, 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 so I'm going to give you some things that you probably shouldn't know, but you have to forget before you leave here. Pilotage is, is the top of the food chain, without a doubt, the top of the food chain. And, and there's got to be, and it was a, there was a, a big piece of me that says some kind of way you got to <coughs> give back or you got to develop. It can't just be uh, a bunch of pilots on ships using uh, a term of art called dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is uh, someone reports a vessel there. You know it. You can't see it, but you know it's there, and you have to kind of figure out where and what time you're going to meet that. That's called dead reckoning. And that's, what mo that's mostly what they did. They had radars. They were developing technology. They were developing what they call an ectus for ships. And, and um, I quickly became, uh, the, the governor appointed me as the president of the pilot commission, which is uh, the investigative police arm of the, of the pilots. Now, when I was on tugboats, up until this, he, he appointed me that in 1980. To 1980, a lot of alcoholism, even amongst pilots, and we started to have drug problems. And in our arrogance, even, and even me said, well, you know, I know they have, they've been having alcohol, but the drugs, that's nasty stuff. And we don't want that in the pilots, because if that ever gets out, we got a big perception problem. So my directive, and I was the youngest of the older, we have to develop a drug and alcohol policy. And this is 1980. Or 81, and and uh, and some of the older guys said, "Well, yeah, but they can't have an alcohol, but they've been drinking." I said, "No, no, no. 
you know, you, that, that's, that's hypocrisy. You can't just develop a drug prop, uh, program and not develop alcohol. I mean, you, can, you can't take drugs, but you can get drunk and they can, they can drop you down off the side of the ship with a, with a heaving line tied around your chest. No, 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 no. It's got to be this all the way. And, and I got, then I got to know the best people in the business, the drug and alcohol people, to advise me, the, the best doctors, of which they, at the time, it was uh, DePaul's had some people that were really, really good. And we developed a drug and alcohol policy. And everybody thought I was a hero again. I was a hero for this. And, oh, Douglas is a hero. He's got, uh, he's got it where it counts. I was getting ready to say something else, but I don't want to make Bethany. Yeah, I said, well, that's good. I'm, I'm a hero. Well, the first one we catch with a positive is an ex-president's son. And, and I pretty much knew it. But when the rest of the pilots, and they, they numbered in those days about 70 pilots. Now there's 150, 120 of them. About 70. They had some who were really good friends. And in Louisiana, politics, politics. Same thing in a pilot association. And they said, well, wait a minute. That's old Captain so-and-so's son. You can't. I said, well, you know, we're going to give him a chance if he goes in the re We already had him. He said, give me, a, give me a lie detector test. I said, really? We gave him a, he almost blew up the machine. I mean, this guy, was, he was a bad dude. He was not just using. He was dealing. And... and uh, we should have known something when, I mean, pilots used to use pagers in those days. He had six pagers in his, on his name. And I said, nobody ever said anything? I mean, well, well, we gave him a chance for rehab. He'd check in. Two days later, he was out. And we gave him two or three chances. He's out. Well, now I wasn't a hero anymore. I was a no good, rotten son of a bitch. <laughs> quick. It was quick. And, and, and so you have to stand up and be counted. That's where your, your mom and, you, and, in my case, my mother's uh, in part about integrity. And, and, uh, and, and doing the right thing and what's best for the whole port of New Orleans. I just got to be a lot more universal in my thinking about, well, I'm not just a pilot. I'm really representing pilots, and I'm representing the port of New Orleans. Everybody that works within the port of New Orleans represents them in some way. So I want it to be positive. Well, we went the full 10 yards with him and kicked him out. You know, we gave him a chance, kicked him out. I was still the no good son of a bitch. And, uh, and as soon as I got finished with that, that was the first drug and alcohol policy in this country, in the maritime industry, first. That was something, because all the, big, the biggies, uh, they had a lot of U.S. carriers in, Likes Brothers, they all said, well, they didn't want the liability of having to deal with that. But as soon as we tried it, had it codified into law, we enforced it, zero tolerance, they, people picked it up. Now, and for so many years, I think into the mid-80s, the co that's a Coast Guard policy. They don't have a zero tolerance. That's, a, that's an accepted Coast Guard policy. That's an accepted policy of all pilot associations. In fact, it is a drug and alcohol policy of the maritime ministry. It started right here in New Orleans, and it started with integrity. And, and every time somebody said, son of a bitch, I'd, I'd say, excuse me. <laughs> you know, that, that, and that, right after that, the Exxon Valdez, 1989, goes on the rocks. I mean, um, the President of Pilot Association, Mark Lesson, now we're in Washington, and it, that'll be, it'll go into night, uh, nighttime mode from time to time. Um, go uh, in Washington, you could cut the tension with a knife. They were so mad. How in the hell is a tanker go into a Bly Reef, rip the bottom out of it, because the captain was probably drunk down below, and they left a poor third mate who couldn't slap his butt with both hands at the same time. And, I mean, it was like a, a comedy of errors. And then, and we, we've always been political, very close to our congressional delegation, Senator Bro, Congressman Tozan, and, but we, do, we, didn't, we did this over dinner, not lunch. And, and they both said, told Mark, and they told me, and they knew Mark better because he, he's like $90 million plus. So they knew him a lot better than them. Said, uh, yeah, that we want a vessel traffic system in New Orleans, and and you need to help us with this. And Mark said, Douglas will be happy to help you with it. <laughs> and pilots hated it. Everybody hated it because they had an old dead reckoning system that was a joke. It was a waste of time, and and that was defunded and taken apart and dismantled years before. I, I looked at it as a challenge. I said, there's so many things that we can do with this. I kept thinking of the Port of New Orleans and cruise ships, the possibilities, all-weather navigation, 
How could we use this equipment? How could we use pilotage in an in a even more positive vein? So it took us about, um, started in 1990 working with the Coast Guard as a partner. And uh, I was in Washington a lot at a place called MITRE. MITRE is a government, public-private partnership that's a big major think tank. At, you walk into the room and it, it, it gets a little fuzzy at first until you start to understand what they're talking about. That's when I would lean on a person like Bethany and say, what the hell are these people even talking about? You know, they were talking dit, in dots and dashes and bits and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, this is all data. Could be, come down and hear. Well, we developed VTS New Orleans. And, and one, of, one of my goals was, in, and I was a son of a bitch, they want pilots in that vessel traffic center. Everybody did. Uh, at the time, the Coast Guard, and they still are, wonderful friends. It was Admiral Loy, who was the commandant. He was ex-district commander. And I made them say, look, I'll help you with this. Because they, they would, I don't know if they would have got over the, the local hump developing this vessel traffic center if it wouldn't have been for the local input. In fact, I know they wouldn't have Want pilots there. So as soon as it got to be a reality, about 1998, 99, um, I got the money. We were going up for a rate increase. The current president, Captain Gibbs, was heading up that effort. I was heading up the effort to fund pilots in a vessel traffic system, money for education, continuing education, and and uh, and, and they thought, well, th this was like a, a no-go because they had never the Public Service Commission had never seen this before. It was the easiest thing we ever did because it was safety. It was pilots in the center. It was educating people, which is a norm in all other industries, in, in the medical profession, the legal profession. It's a norm. Now it's a norm in the pilots. And I developed an educational program that we, we brought all over the world. You know, we send pilots to scale model ship handling courses in Port Revelle. France, wonderful, great French bread, butter, and, and they are really excellent schools. The one in, uh, in, uh, in England, Southampton, England, um, uh, the, uh, simulation at MyTags in Baltimore, and we had classes here. Not, you know, it, it, actually, we did it, at, well, we did it both here and we did it at the, at the, when they had the building on uh, Causeway through Carroll Shore. We had uh, VTS classes for pilots, and uh, always successful, and we had money to pay for this. And even to the day, that started in 19, it started in 2000, where we started sending people out for these. Continued. Now, now if some people thought it was, ex it was expensive or it was not, not needed because it was never, it never, we never had it before until a cruise ship sent a coming over, the Carnival Conquest, the biggest cruise ship that ever came into the river. It's being built. And so, you know, we have high wires in Chalmette. I think, well, you've way past Chalmette now. They had high wires that they couldn't get under. You had to go either close to one bank or the other bank to, to clear it. So what we did was we partnered again with the Coast Guard VTS, with NOAA, and with the Corps. We surveyed that whole area, the, all the hydro, bank to bank, the high wires, the, the energy department, I forgot who that was, but they resurveyed all those wires and every two or three feet, the exact distance from the water at different river stages. And then we developed, because how do you mark this? Because when you're going down a river in a fog or if it gets foggy sometimes just like that, very, very quickly, or, or at nighttime, you really can't see any of this. How do you mark it? Well, if you put a buoy in the water, that's one more thing to hit in case of this. So we developed a virtual chart. And, the virtu and we had this equipment, because I was already experimenting with this, these laptops, and we, and we, we had just, gotten, just gotten our, uh, the, 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 the database is called an S57 database. Very, very accurate. Just gotten these. So we developed a virtual chart that marked the clearance of those high wires at different river stages. We took all of that remodeled hydro, high wires, and sent the pilots and the ship's captains, the Cornwall captains, to my tag and modeled it over there. What was the best way to accomplish this? And actually, 
I mean, for people who are not mariners, it scared the hell out of you. And, you know, you, you, they have what they call a drift angle. A drift angle is when you, you, when you, uh, you aim for something, but where you're actually going to wind up at is a little ways off. And I'm not going to get too much into the technical side of that, but it's, you've fallen off your mark. Well, the, the, the polygon virtual buoys that people thought were crazy worked every time. You could see it right in your laptop. This is the polygon. This is the go and no go stage. You, you can't hit the middle because you're either going to. I, I thought, I, and jokingly, well, you need to electrocute every passenger on the ship. Well, no. Those high wires are built that if they hit, the whole towers come down. I said, now get a picture of that for the Port of New Orleans with the Carnival Conquest with the tower, with the high wires over the, draped over the ship and everybody being electrocuted. So what we developed was, uh, along with the Corps and, 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 and NOAA, uh, this virtual buoy, this, this, this virtual polygon that enabled that ship to come back and forth, back and forth. Um, it unnerved some people, but for pilots, it was norm. They, we developed it, we had it resurveyed, modeled it over at MyTag, and we even had courses at the University of New Orleans on bridge resource, how do you do this with the bridge, with the bridge team on that ship? Um, Port of New Orleans was tickle pink. They didn't have to turn away anybody. We felt good. And then we go even further, more cruise ships. Good business from the Port of New Orleans. They're really doing their job. And what we quickly found out was that you can't anchor one of these ships in a fog like most ports did in those days. You do that and you got three, four thousand people, two or three thousand people sitting on a ship in a fog with the airport saying, where the hell are they? Uh, you know, are the hotels? And that costs millions of dollars to delay people a day, half a day or so when they miss their flights. So we developed, along with, uh, we had, I, I, that was part of my job, as part of the continuing education, we developed another program called a floating safety zone for cruise ships. We had all the cruise ship CEOs here in New Orleans. We had the chairman of the NTSB to give these guys the, the, the bad side of that. You don't want to see me if after a collision of a cruise ship because it's not going to be pretty. And we wanted them to say that. We had the district commander, the commandant, lawyers, and, and you almost can't go to sea these days without lawyers. A pain in the neck, but they, it's like when he's pain in the neck, so that's, that's absolutely essential. Um, and it was a two-day conference well attended, worked out. We developed a program uh, like this cruise ship. Let me get it off a nighttime display for a minute. You can see it a lot better. This cruise ship would have a safety zone that would go a mile ahead of it and a mile astern of it. And the, there's two pilots on, that, on those cruise ships with this type of equipment and, and the ship's equipment working with the ship's crew. And, and uh, you, the, no one can enter that safety zone unless they get the permission of the pilot who's got the con on that ship. And that pilot's working with vessel traffic in New Orleans with the pilot up there. And if that, it, well, now we've never had that happen. If it did happen, for instance, that somebody just said through stupidity or arrogance, said that, hell with it, you know, there's a big river, I can do this, and, and, they, and something happens, he's going to buy the farm. The onus is on that other vessel, not that cruise ship. So that is the cheapest insurance that these cruise ships, those pilots, and more importantly to me, the big picture of the Port of New Orleans can get. You've got ships that never go to anchor. They've got cruise ships that never have to go to anchor. They meet their flight schedules. They meet their hotels. They're getting on and off those ships in a timely fashion. And that's a big win, not just for this pilot, or even our pilots, but for the Port of New Orleans. And that's, that's the way pilots generally feel, this big picture of how we all work together. So we, we developed that, and, uh, and now we go into uh, the e-navigation part. Um, technology's jumping ahead. And you're starting to see, uh, we, now we had this, we had the accuracy of that database, we had the accuracy of, uh, of this ship, now we have people that have an iPhone with an app that's an information. Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, in fact, we have one of them that's really pretty good, except that it doesn't have the accuracy of that, that database. And, and you can't call this app navigation information. Um, 
And all of this is, all of these things are proven out after something bad happens in court. That's a shame. You know, we want to be preventative, develop programs, develop uh, styles of bridge resource management, education that would, that would, that you, that you could use to prevent any, any act, like the safety zone, that would prevent these accidents or help prevent them. Um, if you walked on a ship, and a lot of people use this, the, 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 those different little apps, and they use them on toes, and, and something bad happens, and, and uh, this all goes into discovery, and, and, and you get a, a judge that understands, and they will, they'll find one. You've got a bunch of them in New Orleans. This is a big maritime litigious society. You find a federal judge that starts to understand the difference between that accuracy and the app, and, that, and this app's going to have a lot of problems. I promise you that. Now, I'm on the Marine Board. I was on the Marine Board for nine years. That's a part of the Academy of Sciences. I move over to NAVSAC. That's an acronym for uh, navigation safety. That's where all the, the new rules and they're going to be written for the, the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. And, and uh, all the new rules are going to, most of the, the, the new rules are going to, uh, going to be related to e-navigation, uh, virtual type of information. On the virtual buoys and the virtual system that we developed for the high wire, and there's no more high wires, by the way. The, the, you know, it took a lot, it was expensive because you had, you had to have it resurveyed, you had to train, you had to send all your people to MITAG, um, and it, it was expensive. Now, they want to develop a part of ENAV that might have virtual buoys, might have AIS, automatic information systems, and that's another thing we developed. I, forgot, I missed that. I'll take credit for that too. 1990s automatic information that's a worldwide requirement now and we te we actually actually we we helped develop it we tested it in the river in the 90s it started off in Sweden and and this is an AIS based system VTS New Orleans is an AIS based system and uh, and most of these little information centers are AIS but it's all internet driven so you can lose your internet um, we we felt like um, developing technology as accurately as possible, the better off we're going to be. I mean, my background being a commissioner was liability, liability, liability. Make sure that it's as accurate as can be. It is a government issued NOAA chart, core chart uh, type of thing, not just some little app you can hammer and hit. You can hammer it. In, in, I mean, they, there's a lot of software people are really handy. They'll do this in their spare time. But uh, my job on NAVSAC, there's going to be an attempt to start to standardize uh, the, these charts, this database. Because when you start marking something virtually, I mean, it's just not something most people want to see. And that's like uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Lee Alexander, who has worked with me numerous times, said, you know, you can build anything you want. You can build a paperless toilet, but you're not going to like the results. <laughs> So when you start marking something virtually, where's the honest broker? Who's going to actually put the dot on the chart and how accurate is that? So you're going to have to depend on Mariners depend on visual aids to navigation. They, they, they depend on other Mariners reporting this out of, out of order, that out of order, this guy sinking, that guy collision. Now when you start marking something virtually and somebody somewhere is actually putting that mark for the chart updates, you're going to have to trust it. Well, you don't have to trust it. You probably won't because it's going to take a long time. Or in an AIS marked aids to navigation, an example, the Huey Long Bridge has uh, channel buoys, and they're, they're hard buoys. And, and they wanted to take them out and mark them virtually. Well, the Baton Rouge pilots just, they called me, what did we do? We already sent them a letter. I said, no, you you need to get your, your commission together and your people together and actually go sit down and talk to uh, the district commander and, and make sure that he understands that this is a no-go. You, you know, we've pilots cooperate with the Coast Guard for a long time. Now you've got to listen to us. And they did. So they left the hard buoys there. They just marked them with AIS. So on, on a display like this, when you're coming down on Huey Long Bridge and it shuts out fog, I mean, your radar could probably pick up those buoys. It does. From up. But now, with a chart like this, you can see the AIS markings also for the channel. 
It's not virtual. They didn't remove the buoys they would, so they couldn't see anything on radar. And they'd have to depend on their chart or somebody putting the right dot in the right place. There's a place for virtual buoys to, like in, in, in channels that have bad, the like Columbia River Bar and things like that. You might maybe, or, or even Houston Ship Channel, that you could replace maybe every third or fourth buoy with a virtual mark. But, but to start removing hard aids and navigation and replacing it with virtual marks is just not a good idea. It's got to be uh, a generational type thing. You, know, you, you, need to, you, need to be, you need to be real smart about that. In, in a port like New Orleans, you have 500,000 vessel movements from Baton Rouge to sea each year. That, I mean, that dwarf, nobody, there's nobody in the world that's got a port that has that much traffic and that distance that's 300 something miles but I mean I've been you know I hate to say I've been there done but I've been all over with in Hong Kong's a really busy port Singapore is a did but when I give them those numbers they just say oh my god what do you do with that so well, you, you do it you do it you know and if it gets to the point where you need one-way traffic for something you you know for post Panamax you're looking at much bigger ships um, or bigger ships deeper draft and there might be some parts of the river that'll require a one-way traffic for a, for a while, but that's all traffic management problems. That doesn't mean everybody else got to stop. It means maybe other vessels will slow down and not meet them at this part of the river. So you get that big container ship going all the way up to where the container docks are going to be in that day. You know, I, I know Gary probably hopes that they'll, they'll fit under the bridge and it's not going to happen. They got to get a couple of container docks below the bridge some kind of way. But there's, you know, you can always do something if you prepare ahead of time, and 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 this was, this is not just the start. This is what, the essence of, safe navigation, accurate navigation is today. Could you? Could yes, we can. <laughs> can you imagine? Is it possible or doable? to do a container terminal on the west bank below the bridge. It's, you know what? That's deep, deep water um, all the way down. Below the bridge, all the way down to, uh, well, right above the Canal Street ferry landing. That's deep water. So, and, and it's a barge fleet, big, huge barge fleet. And uh, you probably have a lot of problems running those people out of there. But a, a, negotia a negotiation of moving that barge fleet, oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, you put 1,100-foot you put uh, passenger vessels on the east bank, a much shallower draft. And, and the issue is, to, do you have enough room to turn it around to go back down? And you put it right below the bridge? Sure, you, you positively could. There's, there's a bunch of places you could put uh, below Industrial Canal, that whole area, that's, you know, the, the, the most costly thing would be dredging, continual dredging, uh, so you get a keel clearance for these big ships. Which is what, Those big ones? I think if they, if they, if they have a 50-foot channel, I bet you'll be bringing 52, 53 feet of draft. I bet you will. Right now, it's a 45-foot. Sometimes they bring 40, depending on 47, 48 feet in and out of here. Yeah. But that whole area from below Industrial Canal down on the East Bank is deep, deep water. There'd be no dredging necessary for that. Yeah, so the answer is yeah, you positively could. But so the evolution in pilotage is really more, and, it, and, and the story gets to be real personal. The, and the personal part is you have to persevere. When you get to be that rotten, no good son of a bitch, you have to develop a thick skin and say, look, what's right and what's wrong? Do a lot of drug, drug addict make a fool out of everybody here? And, and then when they do that, and something bad happens, and then the, the real authorities step in and say, wait a minute, you know, we gave these people all the autonomy that they needed, necessary, and they didn't do their job. They should have been looking at this. And if they weren't looking at this, we're going to get somebody to look at this, and we're going to have a different configuration of pilotage. And then you'll have more people involved. Um, I've taken more congressional delegations on ships than I think any pilot ever did. I've seen the backside of Mary Landrieu so many times that, that it's just, excuse me, ma'am, 
didn't want her to fall down and in the water. If she fell down, you know, she didn't care. You know, she was she's a gopher. I've seen John Bro's butt going up ahead of me, and so you know, he said, "How am I doing, Cap?" I said, "Don't stop." <laughs> I've had the chairman of the NTSB, uh, Mark Rosenker, and, and then we took him to Dickie Brennan's Steakhouse after that. Uh, you know, do my best work over lunch and dinner. Uh, but it was important that all these key people that, were, that could have been so instrumental in either helping us or hurting us know exactly what's going on out here. And, and I felt, no, they, well, the maritime industry really is still one of the best kept secrets. And, 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 and I, yes, sir. That, that segues into what I wanted to ask you. Uh, in general, what do you think the future technological evolutions of this ENAM, or whatever you want to call it, piece, are going to mean for any potential expansions of the port of New Orleans? Because I think where Jim is coming from, evidently you are able to find a port from the river, but it's kind of hard to find from the city. There's one road to it, it's behind a wall. Yeah. I would love to have been a fly on the wall of the Morrill administration, find who decided to jam the <laughs> World's Fair in front of the port, like instead of putting it out by the lake or something. You know? Well, um, you can look at that both ways. So. <clears throat> They, they, well, they had the land to do it there, but they really introduced a lot of New Orleans and the people to the river. That's right. Absolutely. It, it was part of the river. And that was the only, that was the only thing that could have opened up the river politically at that time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The moonwalk. Uh, Mayor Landrieu. Uh, the old man. <laughs> the guy that's a little bit older than me. You know, that was, uh, that was unheard of. That was just a dump. I mean, that was old wharves at one time, I guess. The well, Toulouse is, is, I guess, to the point, that's where the Natchez ties up at. But yeah. when the, that whole bend at Algiers Point, and now it, you can, you can, of course, you get a few people that get drunk and they think they can swim in a river, and you, just, mm -hmm. you read about them on your app and it pops up and one more found dead, right. drowned in a river. You know, but uh, the more... You know, there's going to be a lot of give and take. When I, in, in ha when I was in Hamburg, all up in that, in the entire way up that, that German River, and, and, and in Rotterdam up the Maas, um, you see people, houses, and beautifully decorated. The dry docks, in where, and you, you might see apartment places with these flower boxes, and right next to it is a shipyard. And they, they paint the dry side of the dry docks. You have to look closely to, to see that it is a dry dock. It's not just a big backdrop for a, a, a huge mural. I mean, they just they did they, so you introducing people, but they didn't give up their their maritime approach or their their accessibility to all the dock space that they needed. They didn't put a big old, big old, all of the working parts of their you know, like the bulk terminals thing a little bit more on the lower part for the most case. Uh, but I, I think in New Orleans. Um, you know, I'm 71. I've done a lot. We've done a lot. I've watched this port. Grow. I mean, I'm so proud of this port. I'm so proud to be apart from this, to be a part of this area. Um, I see everything is is on the upside. I, th I don't think you've you've even scratched the surface on on the growth potential growth. It's like I told the they, that little fellow from Princess Cruz. I said, you know, you you want an answer? Come to New Orleans. You know, give Gary LaGrange a call. Give those people a call. Because he was complaining about, can you talk to these? No, I can't talk. I don't want to talk to these. They, they're all right. You want to talk to somebody that's going to facilitate your ship? Bring it into New Orleans. Yeah, you can do it right here. So, but on the upside, post-Panamax, you know, you hear all the, the ports being built here, the proposals here and here. I think this port again, with, with the people at the port of New Orleans, and all the business people, they're going to come up with a good business solution for bringing those. And, and these pilots will do it. They'll bring those big puppies all the way up from sea into some dock somewhere below New Orleans, somewhere. If it's Point La Hache, if it's right below the Industrial Canal, there'll be something done that would help, help this port grow even more. Can I ask another question? You can ask all you want. Uh, in your candid opinion, is there any, or what is driving the alternative suggestions to getting into the river? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean uh, 
You mean uh, letting the whole bottom of Louisiana just flop off into the right. sea? Uh, it's just, it's just, to me, it's just crazy. Getting ready to answer your own question. <laughs> Disgraceful. You know, um, I, not, I've been in the maritime industry now well over 50 years, uh, but I've been in a leadership position for close to 50. I've heard that. that that's not new. That's old. I mean, I've even heard pilots say, you know, if we did this, and we don't worry about that. We just, back, back then it was uh, through Cubit's Gap, I believe. They don't have any contracts for this. They don't know the Huh? They don't know Oh, one of the proposals in the paper was not use, uh, we're not down there, the south, south and Southwest Pass at the mouth of the river, but to dredge another channel that would come up either at around Bell Chase, around English Turn, and meet the river, or Port Sulphur which is billions, billions dollars away. So now you're trying to get money for coastal restoration and somebody's going to get billions to forget about coastal restoration and that's way past my, my time. But that's what's being proposed. That was the article in the paper and they said how much sense that makes. Well, if you ask the people down at Port Sulphur that's going to flop off into the Gulf of Mexico, how important that is, and they're going to say, you better get out of here. You know, we'll shoot you. Or Venice. Or all these communities up and down the river that, that have been living there for generations. And, and who, is going to, who is going to raise the first? Well, who's going to get the, uh, the approval from the environmentalist to start? Because now what you're doing, when you're dredging that area, you're not just dredging open water. You're coming into good, solid ground. Where are you to get permission to cut that ground away like that? And like they did with the Gulf Outlet. Yes. Then Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, for the most part, was they had some channels, but there was a lot of solid ground. And they got that pass that was in the LBJ years, and they cut through good, so it was marsh, but it was beautiful, cypress. And, I mean, everybody was at fault. The dock, boy, everybody, I would say, it's a shorter, it was a shorter, uh, time to get to New Orleans, baloney. Because of the nature of these small channels, you have to go a lot slower, you can't go fast, and there's a whole bunch of reasons. Under keel clearance, ships squat, and you can't steer those ships when they squat too much into the mud. So you have to slow them. So it took about the same time, sometimes even a little bit more time. And what, that, and what the, the Gulf Outlet did was it started out to be a 500-foot channel, Bank erosion, bank erosion from bank to bank that had to be 1,500 feet in some areas. And so they lost so much, and it wasn't until after Hurricane Katrina that they shut, they closed it down. And they're trying to do the best they can to rectify the damages that were done. I don't know if they could, that's like coastal restoration. I don't know if they could ever do that. But um, So now when you think about forgetting the river, for the most part, it's really deep. I mean, you've got 200 foot spots, 300 foot spots. You get down to the lower parts of the river, the Venice, the head of the passes, and Southwest Pass. That's when you get true 45 foot channels that they can take 47, 48 feet up. But for the most part, are really deep. There wouldn't be. There's no dredging necessary for all, that whole area for those post Panamax. And say, so look, what we're going to do now is forget about that. But we're going to spend somebody's billions and cut a new channel and come up to, and we're going to forget about. The whole Mississippi River for that's miles so for 78 miles, and we're going to come right into right right in the Bell Chase area, and you'll come into the river that way. You know, for it, it makes good news, but you think about how practical that is, just from the finance and itself, but from the environmentalist, how you're going to do this, is it really going to be a a better way to do? You know, my thoughts are no, no, you know, coastal restoration. And then they keep saying in, in these articles, you're never going to restore the coast. They got the other people who said, well, yes, yes, we can. If you take all the dredging, because they're getting ready to dredge the river out to a 50-foot tent channel, and they're gonna, they want to use cutterhead dredges. That, so they have some self propel which are underway dredges. They dredge, and then they go dump it in deep water. And then you have cutterhead dredges who dredge, and they pump. And they should have been doing that for the last 100 years. Take that spoil and pump that into where you need coastal re Is it expensive? Yeah. What's more expensive, losing Louisiana or paying for that type of dredging that'll help restore the coast? You know, that, that to me is logic, not forgetting about 
what you've done and cut another channel somewhere else. It doesn't make any, any difference whatsoever. Yes, ma'am. I, I did read that article. Oh, <laughs> yes. I did read that article and they put no money limits on it and it was like, you know, a couple of generations away. And they were also talking about the fact that it was basically all engineers who were coming up with this great idea. So is there any formal agreements or any actions or you know, reaction or interactions between you guys, between the pilots oh, and yeah. the actual there, there will. engineers? There, there'll be, uh, you know, when they're making these plans. Engineering is wonderful. Sometimes. They solve problems. Engineering from, for a reason. Right. Um, if, if you go ask the port of New Orleans from an engineering standpoint, would they have built this entire cruise ship terminal with no ships there? You know, you build it and they'll come. It's a lot of money for if. You know, they, they knew what they had to a point. So there's got to be a reason for building these things. And uh, engineering, uh, I've seen too many projects that were just, they, they, they were a mess. Money. The Coast Guard had VTS systems in different spots that cost millions of dollars that were never used because they were designed with no conceptual input from the local people. It was just software engineers that said, this will work. Well, what about Black Dow Fog? What about when we have... You know, ships that are, are that, that are disabled. How are we going to get them? How are we going to see? That might not happen. And they figured out like a bean counter. Well, that, that'll only happen once every two weeks. Uh, but now, what we know now is like in the Port of New Orleans, you know, you shut the Port of New Orleans down for two weeks. How, how many millions of dollars a day is that? Uh, 300 million per day. Per day. Per day. The, when that uh, the Tintramora cut that barge in half with the guy who's who jumped ship because his girlfriend was using the pickup truck that he attached to the Jeep. On the, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Did, you, did, did, I, did I teach you that? If you have a girlfriend, don't hook up a GPS to your pickup truck and loan it to her. She might be going someplace you don't want to know. He, I, this, the, the captain of a towboat had a girlfriend in Indiana, I believe, attach a, a GPS locator to the bottom of the, of, it was actually, I think, her truck. And he was tracking her all over. And he's on the captain of the boat. And he told the deckhand, you are now the captain. I'm finished. I'm quit. And, then, and the company said, okay, you the captain. Didn't know what he was doing. So he, this guy jumps in his pickup truck, and he's going to drive to Indiana and find him where, where his girlfriend's at. Meantime, this guy is bringing a tow up to, he wants to go into Harvey Canal, which is above the Geno Bridge. And then a lot of traffic. He wasn't talking on the radio. He, he might have been shell-shocked. I mean, you come from the deck up in the wheelhouse and all that traffic's going back and forth, you know, and, and uh, the tanker, Tinter Moore, coming down the river. And he went right across. And there were danger signals, calling, VTS calling. He never answered anybody. Went right across, and the, and the Tinter Moore hit the barge, cut it in half. Anyway, a lot of the oil and barges were draped across the G&O Bridge. Long story short, it took them a while to pick the barges up, but there was 300-something million dollars a day when they had to close the New Orleans, Port of New Orleans for whatever days it was until they could accomplish that. One screw-up from some idiot who doesn't know what he's doing, the guy never should have left it. They should have hung that son of a gun. That's... And, and, and gave his girlfriend a good talking to him. So look, <laughs> check, your Jeep, check the GPS underneath the car. Don't be silly. You, you're dating a nut. And then the guy who was running that boat, they should have hung him too. There's no and the, But you know what happened? The company, the people who own that company, they went to jail. And they went to jail. That doesn't happen in the maritime industry that often. They went to jail. And they should have because they condoned everything. That's kind of the low end... The, the inland towing industry is wonderful. Big, beautiful boats, good system, but you have that low end uh, that they just don't get it. Any more? Well, I've been talking for an hour. <laughs> I would teach y'all how to pilot ships too. I could probably do it with this. But That'd be a good idea. We'd all like to be the pilots here. <laughs> you, got, you got to come with me on your, on your cruise ships. That's what you got to do. Yeah, they got to come with me. Yeah, but seriously, let's, let's make it happen. I'll come with you one day. 
Uh, can you just talk about you know those numbers and, and the, the keys and what, what, what that means that we're looking at? Yeah. Um, this is. Um, I'm gonna do it right here. I got a little. I got my own little pointer. My own little inward pointer. On on the right side, over here. Well, the, the, I have. The, let me just. I'm not. This is these six different. The numbers up here, there's six different, they're all charts, but they're all configured differently. I, I, they just gave me a brand new one, so I didn't configure them myself yet. But for instance, instead of having to reconfigure in the middle of a night a chart, because what's happening, like for chart number three, you have a whole list of things in databases, things that you can do with this chart. That's why it's called a database. Um, and okay. So instead of having to do that for each different chart, before you ever get on board a ship, you, you, you configure each one of these charts. For instance, chart one should have hardly nothing on it. Where am I? Oh, here we go. Chart one should have nothing. And that's really for nighttime navigation. You don't want any, you get this, the kit. We use the KISS principle in the pilot to keep it simple, stupid. It works. Chart two would be similar. Yeah, they made it right. Charts three would be, you'd start to get depth data. Down, down. Chart four is depth data. Now, this is all depth data. It's not as important right here because we've got deep, deep water, but then when you, when, you, when you get down toward the head of the passes, Pilot Town, Venice, the, water, the river shallows up a lot. And uh, we get daily every two days and when the river's rising daily soundings from the Corps of Engineers. The Corps posts that on their website and, and, and our handlers, Raven, they get that reconfigured for laptop and we can download it immediately. You might get a difference of one or two feet in the depth of the water down there which would be, you know, you don't want to be trying to float 47 feet and 45 feet. That It, it doesn't go. You'll, you'll get stuck. So you, we, we get that, that daily surveys, and, and that helps out navigation. How much draft can we take up and down the river? That used to take weeks. Weeks, we could do it within hours now. Um, so you, we've got the, the different charts here. Again, and I, haven't con I have to reconfigure these. Five is nothing, six is nothing. Yeah, again. But the significance is when the, in the parts of the river where it's shallow. All right. Um, on the right side over here, you have uh, my own vessel. This, the name of this ship right here is the uh, corner of elation. I've got the length, the beam, and the antenna location, the, the GPS antenna, satellite navigation. And over here, we have the heading. Uh, my heading is 174. My course over the ground is 175. Just a little bit of pilotage because I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. The difference between your heading and your course over the ground, we talked about drift angle a while ago, is drift angle. You know, this is what you're actually heading, and this is your course, to where you're tracking over ground. And if there's a little difference, that's called a drift angle. Uh, speed over the ground, and it's, right now I've slowed down. It's 15.9 miles per hour, not knots. Because everything is and in the waters, everything's configured in statute miles, not knots. But I can do this in knots if I wanted to. And then the bearing, my next bearing would be 158. Time to go, 43, 40 seconds. Distance is, well, it's less than a mile. It's feet now. My ETA, uh, and, and I, I didn't put an ETA on this thing, but anywhere I want to go, if I'm coming in from Pilot Town, I want ETA to the cruise ship docks. I'll plug in the cruise ship dock. It'll give me my ETA up to the dock, and it'll, it'll change depending on my speed. So theoretically, with e-navigation, if anybody poured in New Orleans, and this is something we need to be talking with Paul with in the future, if they wanted to know this, if they wanted a visual of exactly what, where is he at exactly, what's his speed, what's his ETA, not just with this, with, but with any ship, they could, they could access this. That would be part of the shoreside facility of e-navigation. How do you want to, you know, what do you want to see? How do you want to see it? And through, is this going to be through a single window where everybody can enjoy the same information? Or is it going to be like a lot of federal agencies really screwed up? Where everybody's using different systems and they don't know how to link them together. Uh,
down here at the bottom, these are all the other vessels that the closest ones to me, and you'll see that the distance and bearing from me, its course and its speed. And I could, on these here, let me, let me just give you an example. Here, here, um, up. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, Jean Lafitte. See all these tags, Jean Lafitte, making full, these are on different vessels on the river. I'm going to, let me get somebody coming my way. So it's the tri triangle that the Triangles, yeah. yeah. That's all IMO required. They developed that, and I think that's okay for the most part. I don't want to be too critical, but I can be critical. All right. If I click on this guy here, the Haley Brook is making uh, 1.8 miles an hour. Uh, he's two statute miles from me. That, that's me right behind him. And right here will give you the, the uh, that's where I'll overtake him, right about here. You see that they have a square? It'll give you the time and distance that I'll overtake him. Or I can do this the one. The black cube is indicating which direction it's going? Yeah, the, the vector. Okay. You see, the Samantha, I'll meet the Samantha. If the Samantha's making 1.7 miles an hour, I'll meet him in 11 minutes and 13 seconds. And I'll meet the, uh, the right where the circle's at, that's where I'll meet the Samantha at. So it'll give me, and I mean, even if I couldn't see, I could probably see him at, at this point, but where you have these real serpentine parts of the river where you can't see them, it'll do the same thing. So all these tags are the names of vessels, the speed of the vessels. And I can, now for me, I, for the most part, I take all of that off because it can get involved on the top of the charts and there's some things that could cover. I take most of that art, most of that off. And we get down to, let me see. We're a good ways down the river now. All of these vessels going down the river. You see the vector here? This is, uh, making four, this is another ship. Should have its name. ATB Freeport, 13.8 miles an hour. It's 30 statute miles away from me. And these, are, these, these, pro, these systems are developed so that you could, like a radar, you can glance at them. Range rings. You can just glance at it quickly, figure out who you're going to meet, where you're going to meet them, what time you're going to meet them. Most of the, for the most part, I can do as regular. If I can see this, what I have in a click, but then might when you start getting a whole bunch together, you might want to click on one or two to see somebody might be a little bit faster exactly where and what time. Because with some of these cruise ships, you really don't want to meet like this is Fort Jackson right here at the top, and that's a big turn. And those cruise ships, if they don't use their, they have fin stabilizers to keep them stable in bad weather. They don't use that in a river. So if you're going around Fort Jackson or Fort Saint Philip. Sometimes they tend to lean over quite a bit, and and, and you know that that throws the cornflakes off the table. They, they don't want that. They say that's really not a good thing to do. Did y'all finish off your potato chips or anything? <laughs> uh, what about security questions? I see that. See the top cop over there. But it, there's <laughs> security questions on these things are getting to be. I have uh, a woman from uh, the maritime. She's head of the U.S. Maritime Transportation Program. Her name's Helen Broves, a lovely woman. And um, she wants to know because we're going to have her down here. She wants to know if she can get on the ship with me. And I said, well, you know, the security issues are so really tight, especially on cruise ships. And uh, she says, well, I'm the head of us. <laughs> You know, they don't care what you're the head of. You better have the right security, the right clearances, or, or we can't do it. 
And by the way, wear pants. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want to see women climbing up and down ships with dresses flying all up in the air. I've done that so many times that one, one woman with the uh, NTSB was coming down off a pilot ladder because they couldn't put, and dress flying all over, and I'm, oh my God. Uh, she says, how did I do? I said, you did fine. She says, you know, and I'm four months pregnant. But, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> four months pregnant. But uh, security is, is, is tight. Now, I can't, you know, one time we had uh, the captain of the port's office call me. I was on a cruise ship. And they said, uh, Captain Brooks, could we speak to the captain? He called me on my cell phone. And um, so what's the problem? He said, well, we think there's a bomb on your <laughs> ship. A bomb on my, the one I'm on? Moi, and uh, so yeah, they they found some hand grenades in the cruise ship terminal in the in the in the garbage, and, and they had the uh, they had the bomb crew over there. They don't know if any one of them came, to, so we got the captain up and went through the drill, flipped the ship around real quick, brought it to anchor. Then they had a team. Well, what it was was. It was hand grenades, but they were, they were all empty. Was, they, they, they got them at some shop in the French Quarter. They were, I guess, props or whatever they, but, you know, you, if you're a security officer and you're looking at a, what looks like a real hand grenade or a bomb, you better treat it real, I guess, you know. I mean, that's far, that's pay, way past my pay grade. <laughs> I'm thinking, me? <laughs> um, and everything was okay, but it took four or five hours to make sure everything was okay, both from the terminal at Arado Street and on board the ship. They went through that whole ship. I think that the, I, I don't know how they did it. If they went through the cruise list or what they did to see who was who, or if there was any, anybody that they would suspect, but there was none on the, there was no fake grenades on the ship at all. So whoever bought these things at this gift shop, or where we bought them at in the French Quarter, said, hey, I probably shouldn't be, I shouldn't have these on the ship and dumped them in a receptacle and the toilet in the, in the cruise ship terminal. But, and, and going forward, um, you're gonna, I think security's gonna tighten up even more. With this, you think about, uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, because there's a whole hell of a lot of cyber security. You know, I mean, what's gonna stop someone from entering that? It's wide open. The internet, this thing's wide open. And, and, uh, Add vessels that's not there. Take away vessels that should be there. Now, pilots. How is this protected right now? Huh? How is this protected? It's not. It's not. I wouldn't advertise that. <laughs> no, of course, it's not. Marine. No. It's only protected by the integrity of, of the, the, the technology. This is a tedious the time division, multiple access. Uh, but, it, you know, if you can crack Sony, if you can crack the U.S. government's programs, you damn sure can crack this. Now, the big issue, the U.S. has their crack team of people from the Department of uh, Transportation looking into this. And how do you protect it from the international side? Now, this is mostly international ships. It's all international. They just kind of look away and they're saying... Well, well, we'll require you have this equipment, but we're not going to tell you how to protect it. It's up to each country to try and protect this the best way they possibly can. So it, it's, it, you, you could say that it's an accident waiting to happen. It's a catastrophe waiting to happen. Um, now, that's where we talk about technology and people. Can you really do drone and can you really do peopleless type stuff or can you actually develop a program that'll fly a jet right into an airport and kill a bunch of people? Yeah, you can do all of that. But you have pilots on these things that know this. They don't know this river by the pipeline or the mile mark. They know this river by the rock, the tree. I promise you that. That's what you learn early on. What mark is that tree? What mark? How long has that rock? The rock's been here for 100 years. I mean, they, you could come up above Calcai, which is uh, about mile 30, 33. It's an oil dock. And go ahead and close and, and suck the water off. And you would see an old gunship, uh, uh, Civil War, not Civil War, yeah, Civil War gunship sunk there. They found it. I mean, they had a group of people that went and discovered that thing years later. I don't know if they picked any part of it up, but we've been, I mean, we've been seeing it. These old pilots said, look, there it is. It pulled the, sucked the water off, and you'd see the, kind of the ribs of this whole thing sitting there. 
How long has it been there? Hmm? Civil War. But you, you know that. That's what you learn. That, that, that's, and you have to learn that. So if, if they were able to break this and, and add vessels that's not there or take away vessels, I mean, you, you would immediately see that. that. There's a network of pilots out there that would see this. But right now, do they have, can they encrypt this stuff? And the people from the Corps of Engineers that have a similar program, they call it River Information Systems, you can make it so tight that it wouldn't work that well for encryption. And uh, they, they don't want to do that. You know, but they, you know, they, they're trying to come up with a But I can promise you, there's not going to be a solution. There's going to be a number of options for the inner waters they can try, but it's going to cost somebody some money. Internationally, uh, you, you through I, International Maritime Organization, you're probably not going to see a lot of effort. They're just going to wag their fingers, oh, this ship just ran over four or five people that they didn't even see. You know, and, and why? Because some little wise ass decided to erase it. Like, did, like all the, the guy shot the man's drone out of the sky the other day? And he, he, you know, he said he was so mad they shot his drone. Well, he, the guy who shot the drone said, he's been over my house. So, you know, this is not good. Not one time, but a number of times. And my wife's getting irritated about it. So he shot the drone out the sky. But we don't intend on shooting from the bridge of the ship. Um, we'll, let, we'll let the people who, who are certified for that, we'll probably shoot ourselves in the foot. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you all. I appreciate, I appreciate your, your patience, and, uh, and I can go on and on about my mother's lessons in life, but they meant a lot to me. Thank you all very much. All right, so if you guys can make it back to 381, Little Hall 381, and Jim is going to talk to you a little bit on about container bars. Yeah, I'm Ha, ha, ha.